We're starting a new series today, which we've called Experiencing the Mystical. You see, the Gospel of John, which we're continuing to journey through, is essentially uh, the Gospel of mysticism. And when I say mysticism, it's not something extraordinary. It's a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with God. And this is what we're going to try to enter together into this mystery of becoming one with Jesus. Jesus, after having washed the disciples' feet, after Judas has left, he looks at his disciples and he says, I'm with you just for a little while longer. And where I'm going, as I said to the Jews, you cannot come. He's leaving, and you can imagine the disciples confused. And then he says, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Here is the heart of the message of Jesus. These are, in a way, his last words, his testament, his will. I'm leaving, now you just love one another. It's as simple as that. But to love one another as I have loved you, which means to wash each other's feet, which means to serve each other, which means no more rivalry and competition. It means coming together, working together, being together to announce the mystery of the love of God. It is from there that Jesus is going to introduce us to an extraordinarily beautiful, mystical, and spiritual journey. throughout the Gospels, we've been seeing a number of things about belief, about love, about shepherding, about power and humility, by the way people are called to be with each other, by being reborn. How is all this going to happen? This was the question of Nicodemus. How is this going to happen? And of course, the disciples, that must be in their heart also. How is this transformation going to come about? And so it is this discourse where Jesus is gradually going to show people how it's going to be. And we will see that it'll come about because Jesus will give them a new force. He will transform them. And what he had said to Nicodemus to be born from above, it'll become clearer. And this is the whole mystery of what I would call the mystical vision of John. What is sad is frequently Christians have not seen this mystical journey. In a way, they've been given a religion which frequently has been more morality, lawful, dogmatic, and that has brought some confusion. In a way, I think everybody is searching that trying to peak under the reality to find the source of reality, that trying to find this place of the infinite. And because, and the mystery is that many have not found it, so they try to seek it elsewhere, and I can understand that. They can seek it in, in other Asiatic religions where there's an incredible beauty. They can even seek it in, in rave parties and with all the dangers that might be there, there's a desire to break through from rationality into an experience of the infinite, and sometimes also an experience of togetherness and of com community. And Jesus has come to show us, he, in a way, he's opened up doors, and he's inviting us to go through the door to live an authentic experience of love, 
an authentic experience of the infinite, and an experience of the infinite which doesn't take us away from our bodies, doesn't take us away from the world, but brings us back into the world. Because the heart of the message will be, as we get to know Jesus better, he will send us into the world, into all the mess of the world. And there we will discover in the mess of the world, in the pain of the world, a presence of God. So Jesus begins in a very gentle way. He says, let your hearts not be in anguish. And in the hearts of many people, there is anguish because they are dissatisfied with just the rational, the concrete, the busyness of the world. They're wanting something else. The whole history of humanity is a history of searching for the infinite over and above the, the reality which closes us in. We don't want to be closed in in a prison. We want life. We want doors to be opened to us. So don't let your hearts be in anguish. Trust in God and trust also in me. Don't you know that in my father's home there are many dwelling places and that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I'm preparing a place for you, I'll come back and I'll bring you to me because where I am, I want you to, to be. This is God, <laughs> this incredible loving God who wants to be with us and us with God. And then Jesus seems to make a rather strange remark, almost contradictory to what he has said, but it's a remark that's going to provoke a number of questions. You know the way to where I'm going, because this brings, Thomas say, but we don't know where you're going. How could we know the way? And then Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. And you have known me. If you have known me, you have known the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then this provokes another question. You see this urge which is in, in all of us, and it was in Philip, but show us the Father and that'll be enough. I mean, isn't the cry of humanity that? Show us God and then it'll be all right. Have I been with you so long, Philip, and you still don't know me? You see, you have, if the one who sees me has seen the Father, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Here we have these incredible words, which in some way are an incredible liberation. They can be also a stumbling block. It can be like a wall, a sort of either or. Either you're Christian or you're out. But somewhere there's a promise, there's a mystery, and some we have to delve into this mystery with great humility. And there again, like in so many of these things, I feel so little just to penetrate into this mystery of going to God. In the beginning were all things was the Word, and the Word was towards God. And then there's the revelation that the Word is in creation, and the Word comes through holy people. And for centuries, God had spoken to holy people through dreams, through words, through the light of their conscience. And we've seen this through Socrates. We saw it through Abraham. We saw it through many of the prophets. We've seen this through very holy people. That's to say, God never forgot his people. In the whole of creation, God, in a mysterious way, was walking with the people. 
the darkness never overcame the light, and the light was always there. And then through the prologue, we discover that this word which was in so many people, guiding people in the ways of God and revealing God, we discover that the word became flesh. This is what is revealed to us. Those who have seen Jesus have seen God. And so the word becoming flesh does not destroy all these magnificent ways where people lived in the light of God and walked in the ways of God and discovered what it meant to be truly human beings linked to the earth and in some mysterious way linked to God. And so we have this sort of mystery that is there that the word made flesh doesn't destroy. He crowns, he fulfills, he, he shows even further. And in a mysterious way, this incarnated God gives energy to everything else. This incarnated God becomes the brother of every man and every woman of this universe. This incarnated God, the Word became flesh, is the friend of everybody. And the way, he has shown the way. He is the way, and he has shown the way. And what is that way? Humility, washing each other's feet, becoming a friend of the poor, exercising authority with love and humility. It is searching truth. It is openness, to become open. This is the way. It's a way of compassion and a way of service. This is the way. And everyone who follows, who lives, who desires, who yearns for this way, which is opening up the heart, they become necessarily a friend of Jesus. Jesus is not just somebody I believe. Jesus gives us a way, and it's this way which makes us the followers of Jesus and the friend of Jesus. He's calling us to be his friend. And then Jesus says something which is astounding. He says, in truth, in truth, if you trust me, if you believe in me, if you trust me, you will do the works that I have done. And even, you will do even greater works. Extraordinary. He's saying this to all who trust in him, that we will be able to do things that he did and even more. Jesus is not talking about multiplication of bread or wine and Cana or Lazarus, no. All the vision of Jesus is to give life and to bring people gently so that they discover the true face of God, that they may live in the presence of God, so he's asking us to trust, to trust that there'll be a power given to us. And then he adds very quickly, whatever you ask in my name, I'll give it you. So that God may be glorified in the Son, and whatever you ask in my name, I will give it. So what Jesus is saying here, that if we trust him really, and if we beg him, each one of us, to become instruments of peace, of life, of truth, and of love, this is what will happen. With our abilities and our disabilities to be those instruments of life so that people move out from despair and become fully living. And what does that mean, fully living? Rejoicing, being men and women who give life, who rejoice in life, who love our universe, who struggle for justice, who struggle for peace. You can imagine the disciples, we are going to do greater things than Jesus. But it's just, just not possible. So now Jesus is going to explain, if you love me, 
you keep my commandments, I will pray the Father, and he will send you another paraclete, the Spirit of truth, which will be with you always. So something new is going to happen. And here we have the secret that Jesus is going to send us a new force. And the paraclete is a beautiful name. <laughs> Frequently, if you read your Bible, it's translated with many names, advocate, consoler, defenser, and others. But maybe the most beautiful of best translations is just paraclete. <laughs> You see, in the Greek, the etymology of this word parakletos is the one who answers the cry. When we cry out to God, he comes, he will come. The paraclete will come into our hearts. And so here we have Jesus making a promise. You see, it's the promise that the world can come to peace, that conflicts can be settled, that forgiveness can come, not because we are capable, but because we will receive this new force. I'd like to just make a little distinction, which is quite beautiful, between spiritus and paracletus. Spiritus, you find, we've spoken here, the spirit of truth, but you find throughout the whole of the First Testament, the spirit of God, the spirit of God. It's only Jesus who uses the word Paracletus, spiritus. What is spiritus? It's a sort of enthusiasm. It's a, a power. It's a force that comes through us. And when you see the prophets, when you hear Ezekiel, Isaiah, you sense in them this incredible force which goes out of them as they announce the word of God. Paracletus is slightly different. You see, a mother is a paracletus for her baby. You see, as the baby cries out in loneliness, mummy takes the baby. Every person who looks kindly and cares for someone, say, who has Alzheimer, they are paracletus. And God is promising to send us paracletus. Paracletus doesn't give us this movement, but paracletus says, I'm with you, and I love you, and don't be frightened and I'm with you in all things. That is the, the vision that Jesus gives us, is this caring, consoling, loving God. And then Paracletus then will give us the force to go forward to be men and women of peace, men and women who bring love and compassion into our world. We will become in, in a mysterious way the face and the hands of God because God dwells in us. Then Jesus tells his disciples that the paraclete, the Holy Spirit that he gives and the Father gives, will not just be abiding in us, but will bring back to our memory all the things that he has said. So this doesn't in any way mean that we don't have to do theology or study. But he, what he is saying is that whenever you study the Word of God, or whenever that you are working in reality and becoming competent as a doctor, some of the Holy Spirit will be in you so that all you learn will be for life and for love and for peace. And Jesus then will say, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. But not as the world gives it. And this peace that Jesus gives will not be an absence of desire. It'll not be the way the world gives peace, which is an equilibrium, a balance of forces. You see, the peace Jesus gives is 
presence. It's a presence of love. It is that certitude that he loves you, that he loves me. And then when we have that conscious that God is present in me, that he loves me, everything changes. I don't say that we don't have to work for things, but just to have that knowledge that, that God is present inside of me, it's not the elimination of all anguish, but it's somewhere that certitude which will permit me to go forward in truth. So Jesus is saying to each one of us that he wants to give us his presence, his peace. I leave you my peace. I give you my peace, not as the world gives it, but it's really this, this presence of God so that each one of us, we can live in the peace of Jesus, in that consciousness that Jesus is living within me.